Yes, we are live. Okay, good evening, everybody, uh, NIUS students and everybody else present here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have with us now uh, Professor S. Ramakrishnan, uh, who is the director of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. And he has kindly uh, agreed to find, uh, to take time out of his busy schedule to come and talk to you. So this is a special lecture. And uh, Professor Ramakrishnan, of course, needs no introduction. He's a very well-known uh, experimental physicist in the area of condensed matter. His uh, main uh, research interests are in the areas of superconductivity and vortices and magnetic fields. And we will uh, hear uh, basically low temperature physics. And that is what his specialty is. And uh, he has been at TIFR for uh, more than uh, 40 years now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's a huge volume of work that he, that he has carried out here uh, with uh, more than 200 uh, publications and uh, guided many students over many years. So uh, many of the people at various institutes across the country are uh, were his students at some point of time. So uh, uh, we are eagerly waiting for uh, Professor Ramakrishnan to uh, tell us more. So over to you, Professor Ramakrishnan. Thank you, Anvesh. Uh, first of all, good evening to everybody. I'm sure you will be tired at the end of the day. So what I'm going to tell you is a kind of a story, you know, which, uh, which of course uh, involves the basic research. So as you must have seen, the TFR is a place where we build equipment at large scale, small scale to address one, you know, one or two specific problems. So I am a condensed matter experimentalist and uh, we have developed a certain world-class system, which I will tell you about, to go to very ultra low temperature to look at one specific problem. So instead of first telling you how do we go to ultra low temperature, let me address the problem which made us to go to this uh, ultra low temperature domain. Okay, so see the low temperature, the most interesting things, many things happen at low temperature. The, one of the most interesting things happened when Camerling owners cooled liquefied helium, helium, helium. So he, He's the first one to liquefy it at 4.2 Kelvin at 1908. Immediately, he, you know, those days, you know, 100 years ago, that is the lowest temperature achieved anywhere in the world. And then he decided to look for uh, properties of materials such at low temperature. So to his surprise, he found this mercury, which is the, found to be really going to a, Resistantless state at 4.2 Kelvin, which we call, which he called as superconductivity. So this is what the basis of people, you know, to go to very lower and lower temperatures because those tiny interactions which leads to such a macroscopic phenomena will not, you know, it didn't happen at higher temperatures. So that is the that is the important aspect of any low temperature or an ultra low temperature physicist. So you want to get into a temperature field regime where nobody has gone before and see whether those tiny interactions are there give rise to new interesting physical properties. So, so what do we do? So many times the novel phenomena occurs at temperatures, only at low temperatures. The perfect example is superconductivity. Once this phenomena is known in mercury, for instance, then, you know, it's a kind of a metallurgy and some intuitive idea to choose multiple elements to raise this phenomena, which was happening at 4.2 Kelvin, to at higher temperatures where it is, can be of some practical importance. So, as I, as I told you earlier, mercury was superconducting at 4.2 Kelvin and uh, in 1911, then this uh, high temperature superconductor based on mercury and barium, calcium, copper oxide was superconducting at uh, 140 Kelvin in 1993, which is at ambient pressure. Very recently this year, they squeezed the hydrogen sulfide coupled with the carbon. It's, it is called CH8X material, 
at 2.7 megabar it's a very high pressure and they achieved superconductivity at 288 kelvin already it is at 15 degree centigrade so you don't have to go to lower temperature to look at this so what is the methodology you go to very low temperatures find a phenomena use a use a you know your ideas of uh, judicious choice of alloys then possibly the same phenomena could happen at higher temperatures of course uh, you know this is at a pressure such a high pressure this will not have any practical use but then that doesn't deter people to try and see whether we can achieve the holy grail is uh, room temperature superconductivity we are far from it right now so so the the important aspect of superconductivity you know when kamerling owners discovered this uh, superconductivity he presented to the to the big society at large in the in the leiden community so one of them asked what is the use of going to such low temperatures so kamerling owners typical answer is only time will tell so then you see now you see an mri you know magnetic resonance imaging which is a in every major hospital you have this to you know uh, as a medical diagnosis this is the magnetic field is provided by a superconducting magnet then you have power generators transportation you know this megalev train which goes at 500 km hour is also based on superconductivity quantum computing medical so the application of superconductivity has become widespread but uh, you know if all of them requires one drawback is that low temperature so if one can find a material at room temperature that is the holy grail of superconductivity so many of the researchers are still not given up and uh, there are people who are squeezing the material and getting a room temperature superconductivity there are people who are looking at superconductivity with a different mechanism which can raise this temperature to a practical way whether things can be used so this game is on for the last 100 years or so so what is where do we come in so we wanted to know that you know once the superconductivity was discovered in mercury the race was on to test the superconductivity of almost all the elements of the periodic table so then we see what you see in the green are the ones which are superconducting at ambient pressure so it varies from let's say 9.2 kelvin to niobium to 350 micro kelvin for rhodium and the ones in yellow are superconducting under only under pressure or in some thin film form not in the normal ambient conditions so you see that superconductivity is a widespread phenomena i mean it is you know many of the metals when you cool down probably the ultimate ground state is super, superconductor there are notable exceptions like magnesium sodium potassium also copper gold silver and so on which refuse to become superconductor i will come to this little later in my talk in this case the bismuth is a really curious curious uh, element see unlike most metals the carrier concentration the electron concentration is about 10 to the power of 22 electrons per centimeter cube bismuth is a semi metal with the equal number of electrons and holes and it has five orders of magnitude smaller electron concentration so our aim is to see whether does bismuth superconduct if it superconducts what is the mechanism for superconductivity so that is what the, our aim is to start so with this in mind we decided to look for superconductivity in bismuth which i will explain to you why is it so important okay be before that so as i said as i told you that once the mercury started superconducting people looked at all the elements of the periodic table to see superconductivity some found success but as the tc the superconducting transition temperature goes lower and lower things became a little difficult for instance you know superconducting iridium which is an element it's at 113 millikelvin then tungsten which is at 15 millikelvin beryllium because of its toxicity we couldn't purify 
later found to be superconductor in 1967 at 27 millikelvin then it took a long time you know from beryllium to rhodium it was almost 16 years the the cooling technique got better the what is known as dilution refrigerator which i will explain to you came into existence then people went up to 50 micro kelvin to see the superconductivity of rhodium then it took another 24 years to find the superconductivity in lithium so what we have found out for this superconductivity in bismuth after 9 years so so that is the trajectory in which the superconductivity of pure elements have been found out so the people involved this is already published some some time back in science and then uh, uh, it's going to come in nature physics soon i think from the next year so the people who are involved are om prakash who did his uh, phd thesis on this and then we have an excellent scientific staff anil kumar and then the single crystals are grown in professor tamilvel's lab i think professor tamilvel must have given you a lecture or is going to come soon i think on crystal growth so what i am going to tell you is briefly on the theory and tell you that why this theory is not uh, useful for bismuth so the as i told you the superconductivity in periodic table most of them can be explained by what is known as bardeen cooper and schrieffer's theory it's called the bcs theory yeah happened in 1957 for which they got the nobel prize in 1972 so what they did was they took the idea of froelich who said that see what is a metal metal you have a periodic arrangement of atoms and then you have a conduction electrons moving around so when a electron passes through this positive ions which are neatly arranged on a lattice there is a lattice distortion very tiny lattice distortion what i have shown you is an enlarged version of it so as the conduction electron moves through the lattice the positive charge cloud accompanies this electron you know because there is a local distortion the positive ions get attracted to this uh, electrons and then so you have a positive charge so this electron passes away and the next electron sees this positive charge and then gets attracted to it so in some sense this electron gets attracted to the other one via this mediated what we call as phonon interaction because it's a quantized lattice vibration so directly they won't get attracted because you know like charges will ripple this is a coulomb repulsion is coming to the picture but indirect way they get attracted it's called that's why this electron electron interaction is called it's retarded in time you know one electron goes there is a positive charge cloud created the other one comes in gets attracted to it so this is okay if you if your lattice vibrations are very very small compared to the velocity of the electrons see the ions have to move slowly compared to the electrons which happens in most of the metals why the fermi energy of the most of the metals are in electron volts whereas the thermal energy which is the de bay energy of the atoms are of the order of milli electron volts so the condition of pcs theory is well met you know it's a theory of adiabatic adiabaticity so the electrons move faster the ions move so slowly that there can be an electron electron interaction this is working correctly for almost all the metals but not in the case of bismuth bismuth you will see because the carrier concentrations are small the fermi energy is much much smaller than the lattice energy so the bcs theory if bismuth is found to be superconducting cannot explain this it is not meant for bismuth we will look into this a little more so this is the basic thing so what we what is a metal so in metal at absolute zero you have a well defined fermi surface in the reciprocal space so the electrons have energy energy states which fills this fermi sphere and at t is equal to 0 there is nothing after this fermi this fermi sphere so what happens when you have a so the energy is a it's a function of density of the electrons and these are constants planck constants as well as the mass of the electron up to the power of 2/3 so if the n is small 
the EF gets smaller. Since it is for metals, it is of the order of 10 to the power of n is of the order of 10 to the power of 22. So you have EF is of the order of uh, 10, 9, 10 electron volts. So you will see that for bismuth, it is 9.5 electron volts. For tin, it is 11.7 .7 electron volts. Aluminium, it is 10.2. You see bismuth. Bismuth is only 25 milli electron volts, almost room temperature, right? Room temperature is something like 26 milli electron volts. So it's extremely small compared to all the other, other metals. So what happens? How do we say that, you know, what is responsible for superconductivity? So that we can see, you know, this small plot energy as a function of uh, density of states. Density of state is the number of states available in a unit energy. And you can see that the one which is shaded is the what happens in absolute zero. So when you have, have a finite temperature of KBT, then the, el the electrons move from the region one to region two, and the electrons which is close to this Fermi level are the ones which is responsible for all its electronic properties, including superconductivity. So how does one get superconductivity out of these conduction electrons which are close to the Fermi level? So the person who tried to do that was Leon Cooper. So what he asked, he asked a question, suppose you have conduction electrons which are just outside this Fermi surface and they have an attractive interaction, just like this attractive interaction I told you about. So what happens to the system? He showed that if such things happen, then the Fermi surface is unstable. That is, if you have an electron which is spin up, you know, at, uh, bound to a spin down electrons with a different momentum, and uh, this Fermi sphere is unstable with respect to, because energetically it is better to form these pairs as compared to simply filling up these energy levels of the Fermi sphere. So what happens is that then the Bardin and Schrieffer took this idea and showed that, uh, and showed that, you know, if you look at a thin window of energy scale close to this Fermi level, I have just very much exaggerated that. H cross omega 2 is tiny compared to the EK and EK2. So in a tiny shell, we can have an attractive interaction and it is zero otherwise. If you assume such a small window which is responsible for superconductivity, you can find an expression. That is, the superconducting TC is related to the dead by temperature, density of states at the Fermi level, and this is the interaction between the two electrons which are just outside the, close to the Fermi surface. And uh, you can also then have an energy gap between the ground state and the excited state, which is called delta, which is the universal relation. And the density of state is related to the electron phonon coupling constant. Instead of a simple Coulomb parameter, now we are talking about not two electrons, large number of electrons. So they are screened. So that is why it's called mu star. It's called the screen Coulomb parameter. So forget about this equation right now. Just apply this equation to the system which we have. So let's say it's sodium. We know that the debate temperature of sodium is 153 Kelvin. So the lambda is 0.16. So if you plug in these uh, values into that expression which I gave you, you get one nano Kelvin for TC. Of course, nobody is interested in sodium. So nobody has ever cooled it uh, to such a low temperature to see whether it is superconducting or not. Aluminium. Aluminium, the TC given by BCS is 2.5. The TC observed is 1.2K. So it is not very surprising. The important thing people, many people miss out is that BCS theory never predicts the correct temperature. BCS theory tells you what is the mechanism which leads to superconductivity. So people blame the BCS theory because they thought that it should accurately predict the TC. No, because see each material has its own Fermi surface, all other complications coming in, which is not being considered by BCS. They just put the, you know, the interaction as minus V, that's all. And it is zero elsewhere. It's a very simple assumption. The idea of the beauty of the BCS theory is to show that 
how the attractive mechanism comes between the electrons and how it is coming, how the superconductivity is produced. They were never said that you should take this as a God-given formula and try to get the DC out of it. But remarkable, even with such a drastic assumptions, we are not very far, you know, 10.2 theory experiment says 7.2. Magnesium, of course, is a question where people predict 30 milli K, we have gone down to 100 micro Kelvin, we don't see anything. Bismuth is the other way around. The theory predicts it should be at 0.2 nano Kelvin. Whereas the experiment I will show you, it's at 500 micro K, 0.5 milli Kelvin. So it's ultra here. That is because the theory is not applicable here. So you can't use the same theory for a case where, you know, things are not applicable. I told you, right? In bismuth, you have a lattice energy which is comparable to the Fermi energy. So the adiabatic approximation that, you know, the ions will relax and then the electrons come and get attracted, that won't happen. That will not happen. So the basic assumption of the BCS is gone. So, so we come back to the bismuth again. So as I told you that, you know, we have bismuth is five orders of magnitude in carrier concentration, less compared to the normal metals. So what is so special about bismuth? Actually, if you look at the periodic table, bismuth is the one which is studied for a long time and still being studied. You know, it's more than 100, what, 100, let me just go back. And, it, it, you know, it's almost now, what, uh, 250 years or 220 years or so, we still, there are still interesting aspect of bismuth. People are looking at it. It started with the diamagnetism attributed to Faraday in 1845. Then you have Seebeck effect, Nernst effect, Kapitzas. All these things are textbook cases. You know, all the things. See, the Seebeck effect was first discovered and then Seebeck put, a, put forth the theory. Same is the curse with the Nernst. So all these things came because of Bismarck. So, and... Uh, Around 2000, 2002, they, there was a lull because people thought that they have, you know, discovered what is about bismuth uh, all, all are over. Then came with the vengeance in the last 15 years. There are very, very new aspects of bismuth, including, you know, topological properties and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's gone into a different uh, dimensions now. It's still bismuth is being pursued in different aspect in thin films and so on. The most interesting thing about bismuth is came from our high energy colleagues. You know, they found a bismuth which was used for medicine, you know, for treating stomach disorder and so on. They found alpha radioactivity, which is at 3.1 MeV. And uh, many anyway, good thing about alpha activity is that it dies before it comes out of the bismuth atom. It's such a short range. But then the half-life is about 10 to the power of 19 years, you know, which came as a nature paper some 18 years ago. So this is billion times the age of the universe. So you can safely say that this month is stable and then move away from that point of view. But it's an interesting twist which came several years ago. So what is again special about this month? So I told you that... Unlike the other metals, the carry, where the carrier concentration is flat, you know, there is no temperature dependence of the carrier concentration. Bismuth is really funny. It still has a temperature dependence of carrier concentration. As you go from room temperature to the low temperature, it goes by a factor of almost 10. This result has been a beautiful result. It's been there for the last 50 years. Still, there is no decent theory which tries to explain why the carrier concentration should go down in this month. And uh, as I said, the low carrier density and low Fermi energy, which means its mean free path is extremely, and it has a lower effective mass. So that means because of the carrier concentration is small, it has a very large mean free path even at room temperature. It's about two micrometers and it can go to few millimeters at two Kelvin. So imagine if you have a completely large mean free path system, like say five millimeters in bismuth, 
which means the electrons are ballistic. Electrons are not having any collision in that material. So to measure transport and so on, it is a huge, huge task because most of the contribution is coming from the boundary scattering, not inside the material. So it's, 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 it is a really difficult to determine its absolute resistance of the system, the intrinsic boundary resistance you can compute. So that is another puzzle. I mean, that, that is another interesting thing about Bismarck. Silicon, of course, has also has a carrier concentration difference, but that is because it is being doped by other elements. So that is the reason why it sticks. Okay, so little more on the atomic physics. So what is bismuth? Let's look at its uh, outer shell configuration. It is 6H2, 6P3. So H and P levels are brown here. So if you bring two bismuth atom, actually you should have seen an insulator with a cubic structure. You know, the electrons get paired nicely, the P level as well as S level, nothing is there, no, un, you know, no unfilled shells and so on. So there should not be any, any conductivity, but that doesn't happen in nature. It undergoes a small lattice distortion. Instead of cubic, it becomes a robohedral. And the important thing is that at two different symmetry points, the bottom of the conduction band you know, it is it is lower than the top of this valence band. So it, there is a bond, you know, energy overlap. If you consider these two, these two, uh, these two valence and conduction band, and that is the important criteria of bismuth. The unusual properties stems from this fact that you know the conduction electron is lower than the valence band in this system. So, uh, so what is the yeah. Uh, there are a, a few basic questions. Maybe you can right. clear them. Yeah. Yeah. So the first uh, one is, what do you mean by carrier concentration? Yeah. So see the metals, they, there are some things which conducts the heat as well as electrical conductivity. Which conducts that? The electrons close to the Fermi level are the ones which conducts this. So the carrier concentration of, you know, per unit volume, the number of electrons per unit volume is what is known as a carrier concentration. So in metals, electrons are the carrier concentration. In semiconductors, you will have both metals as well as holes. In semi-metals, it's the same thing. You will have electrons and holes. Holes is a this is, uh, excitation where the electrons leave that place and you have a positive charge. So they are there in semi-metals, semiconductors, and so on. So metals, we are talking about electrons. The carrier concentration means number of carriers per centimeter cube per unit volume. Okay, thank you. There are a few questions which I think you are in the process of answering, but I will still ask them. So several students are asking that what theory explains the behavior of this month? I think you are in the middle of it, perhaps. Yeah, that is that they have to wait till the end. There is not right. a one single theory is there right now. There are many proposals. The jury is not out yet on the, the right theory for this, but I think we can zero into one of the theories. I will come to that later. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you have to wait till the end of my talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. There is also a basic question that how do we precisely measure such low temperatures? Correct. I'm coming to that. See, I have not okay. told you about how to reach and how to measure. So you have to wait the later part of my talk. So what I am okay. setting up is the physics problem. Now I want to set up an experiment to solve this physics problem. So I'm just telling you what is so special about bismuth. Then we will cool this bismuth and show you with the what kind of cooling apparatus we have, how we measure the temperature and get to the superconductivity of bismuth. So that is the right. plan of my talk. Yeah, so I'll let you continue. Some other questions we can take uh, at yeah. the end again. Yeah. So as I said, bismuth should have been an insulator, but because of this, lattice distortion, something similar to the piles distortion, which you will see, you have this semi-metal behavior, you know, unusual band structure and semi-metal behavior. So what is bismuth? Is it a metal or a semiconductor or an insulator? So the, the best way to check is what is known as Mott's limit. This was uh, proved by Sir Neville Mott, late Sir Neville Mott, who is also a Nobel laureate, who got the Nobel Prize for this discovery of metal insulator transition. 
So what he said was, if take A star, A star is the, it's something similar to the Bohr's radius in the system. A naught is the Bohr's radius. Epsilon R is the effective dielectric constant. M naught is the effective mass of the electrons in that system. And M E is the electron uh, effect, the electron effective mass. So if A star to the power of N by three is greater than 0.26, then he says that that is a metal. So it turns out that this uh, empirical rule, which seems to satisfy a host of oxides, intermetallic compounds, all kinds of things, which can distinguish between metal, semiconductor and an insulator. So you apply for bismuth by plugging the values of bismuth, you see that you know it's of the order of 34 and so we are still safe. It is bismuth can be considered as a metal. In this case, it is semi-metal because we have both electrons and holes. But the important thing is that unlike the normal metals where each atom share one electrons, in bismuth, one conduction electron is shared by nearly 100,000 atoms. That is because its carrier concentration is only 10 to the power of 17, five orders of magnitude smaller. So this is the energy level diagram which I showed you before. You know there are different uh, there are different energies for different uh, Fermi surface Fermi energies. One Fermi energy for electrons, Fermi energy for heavy holes and light holes which are there in the system. Forget this for a moment right now. All I want to tell you is that the Fermi energy is extremely small. It's about 25 milli electron volt, as you can see from there, which is comparable to its lattice energy. So bismuth, since it's been studied for 100 years, everything is known. Its Fermi surface is known. And it so happened that it has a very tiny Fermi surface. You see these small blobs, which I'm pointing out with my thing. See, they, these are whole packets, extremely small. And these are electron pockets. There are three electron pockets and one hole pocket, which occupies only just, you know, 10 ppm of this Berlin zone. So it's a tiny Fermi surface. And I'm going to show you that such a tiny Fermi surface, both electrons and hole together, is what is responsible for superconductivity. Yeah. Hello? Okay, so now let me go to the practical points. So bismuth can be grown very easily. You know, it can be grown as a, in air by just pulling the things there. Uh, in, in, the, in the heat, you have a small furnace and you have a small pulley with a motorized pulley. You can just pull it out slowly. In fact, you will see nice crystals with the shining colors and so on, which is basically an oxide which gives you an interesting colors. So, but for our experiment, we need 69 pure bismuth. That is 99.9999% pure bismuth. So it has to be grown in vacuum. And that is what done in Professor Tamil Fay's lab, where we grow these crystals. And it has a rhomboidal structure, as I said. Its unit cell is a rhomboidal with 4.75 angstrom. And it is distorted rhomboidal structure. I told you this distortion is coming from piles like uh, uh, distortion in the system. And uh, you can do an X-ray diffraction to see, confirm its structure. Quality of the crystal, you know, by X-ray uh, backscattering measurements. So what has been done in bismuth before we entered? Bismuth under pressure is superconducting. That is everybody knows. And this result has been there for a long time you know, 3.9 Kelvin at 26 kilobar. It has a monoclinic structure, 7.2 K it goes to tetragonal and then it goes to cubic at very high pressures. But all this and our amorphous bismuth is superconducting at six Kelvin, granular or nanoparticles is between one and two Kelvin. In all cases, you know, all the three cases, the carrier concentration changes. You are not no longer deal with the virgin bismuth. See, the structure changes, its formula will changes, its carrier concentration changes when you do things like this. And most of these things can be explained by BCS theory or a variation of it. But no superconductivity in bismuth was done down to 10 millikelvin. People search for it. It's not that they didn't search for it. 
they search for it down to 10 millikelvin and they thought that since the carrier concentration is very low bismuth is never going to become a superconductor so we decided we decided to test this hypothesis by doing the experiment because that is the best way to do it so now i am coming to this low temperature part so how does one cool systems so typically you have two isotopes helium 4 and helium 3 and uh, by pumping over helium 4 you can get down to 1.2 kelvin and cooling with helium 3 by pumping over this you can get down to about 0.3 kelvin but if you want to go well below that you have to do what is known as a dilution refrigerator which is commercially available and if you want to go further down below 5 millikelvin then you have to build your system so we built a nuclear demagnetization fridge in TFR, which is uh, capable of reaching 40 microkelvin for the electrons and lattice. Important thing is that we can keep this 40 microkelvin for nearly three days, 72 hours. So now my roadmap is explain you the dilution refrigerator, how it works, which is commercially available. Then tell you about what we do in adiabatic demagnetization. So it's not enough to produce this temperature as somebody asked me, how do you measure this temperature? So that is another important aspect which you'll touch upon. Then I will tell you about the superconductivity of bismuth. So as I told you, pumping over helium-4 or helium-3, you can reach to 1.2 K or 1.3 Kelvin. You can't do much below that because the vapor pressure goes down, tremendously down. You can see that, you know, for helium-4, even at something like 0.55 Kelvin, the vapor pressure is so small that, uh, you know, it's very difficult to go below 1.2 K because there is a superfluidity comes in and the film creeps in. So the practical limit is 1.2 K. For helium-3, you can get down to about 0.3 Kelvin and that's all. Because the vapor pressure is so small that, you know, any cooling you can achieve, it is compensated by the heat leak into the system. So all practical purpose, these are the two limiting factors on this. You can also write a simple classic Capron equation. You know, if you look at heat and thermodynamics by Zemansky, it gives you all this nicely and tells you how the pressure is related to the latent heat and temperature. So if you want to go below 1.3 Kelvin, you need to know what is known as a dilution refrigerator. This was proposed by a theorist called Heinz London in 1950. Then it took about 14 years and it was built first in Camerling Ones laboratory to show that such a dilution refrigerator can be made. So what is the basic principle? So I, I told you an interesting phenomena which occurs at low temperature is superconductivity. There's another interesting phenomena which happens for helium. You cool helium below 2.1 Kelvin it becomes a superfluid. I'm talking about helium-4. It becomes a superfluid. What do you mean by superfluid? It has no viscosity. It can flow through anything, you know. So it's a quantum liquid and it has its own very interesting properties. So now if you put helium-3 in that uh, mixture, see helium-3 is a normal fluid at these temperatures. So when you put helium-3 the lambda point, the transition to superfluid state decreases, you know, continuously at this concentration, something like 0.75, you see that it, it splits into two phases. One is rich in helium-3 here, the other is poor in helium-3. So it so happened that you can use this to, to, to do, you know, produce low temperature, basically because the energetic concentration helium-3 floats on the dilute phase because the density of helium-4 is larger, so it just floats on it. So how do we understand this cooling? Simple diagram is that in the evaporation cooling, what do you do? You take helium-3, you pump over the bath. So, you know, the classic Capron equation tells you that, you know, evaporation to reduce pressure, you can get lower temperatures. So the hot gas is again put back and then you can have a continuous helium-3 refrigerator. Here, in helium-3, helium-4 mixture, the energetic particle is helium-3. 
So you are going to take away this energetic particle across this surface. You know, this red blue surface, you have to take it across this by a suitable pump, which is operating at room temperature. So unfortunately, at these pressures, no pump can operate and pull this helium-3 across this interface. So what, what we do is, uh, so this is the heat of mixing. So when you pull this helium, energetic helium-3 atoms across the surface, you can achieve cooling. So, so that's why as opposed to evaporation cooling, this is a dilution cooling because you are diluting this helium-3 from its rich phase across this uh, mixture where this is here, it's dilute in helium-3. So that's why the name dilution cooling came. So what is the pump which we use? So the pump which we use is an ingenious pump in a sense that we have what is known as a still. Still came from distilling. So what you do here, you keep this at higher temperatures like 0 0.7 Kelvin, 700 milli K. Here the vapor pressure of helium-3 is You know, as you know, vapor pressure of helium-3 is much larger than the vapor pressure of helium-4. So when you connect a pump up at the room temperature, it will predominantly pump the helium-3 across this mixture. So the concentration of helium-3 here will be larger than the concentration of helium-3 uh, helium here. So there is an osmotic pressure. You know, the osmotic pressure drives this helium at the bottom to the middle chamber, to the still. So then it gets pumped at the room temperature. So this circulation and uh, will cause this cooling. And uh, you can reach down to about, two to, in an ideal refrigerator, you can get about two to three millikelvin. So the one at TAFR, which was uh, bought in 2005. And uh, so that has a helium-3 dump of 176 liquid, 176 liters of gas, which is about quarter liter of liquid. And the helium-4 dump is about 600 liters of gas, which is about 0.86 liters of liquid. So these are the two uh, mixtures which we use. And then we can reach down to about 5 millikelvin in our system. So since uh, because the COVID, the lab is open, but sometime even then there's this COVID restrictions are removed, I would like you to come and see what we have set it up. Because all this have to be the Crystat helium-3, helium-4 refrigerator you can buy, but the rest, nuclear stage, everything we need to build. So this is the lab, which is at CG35, where we have taken care of electromagnetic radiation, vibrations, and so on and so forth. So, and this is resting on a sand fill, you know, cot sand fill pillars to avoid vibration. So then, as I said, the dilution takes down to about 5 millikelvin. So how does we go well below 5 millikelvin? Then you do an adiabatic demagnetization. So what do you do? Here you are talking about adiabatic demagnetization of nuclear spins. So it is similar to the vapor, vapor, vapor cycle refrigeration. What do you do in vapor cycle refrigeration? You take a refrigerant, put a pressure. So when you apply a pressure, you have a heat and you have to have a medium to take away this heat of compression and then you now the heat of compression is taken it is at temperature and at a high pressure release the pressure so it takes away the temperature from the surrounding so you get t minus delta t so this is what the vapor pressure refrigeration is similarly you do the same thing for nuclear spins spins are aligned random at paramagnetic at some temperature apply a strong field align the field along the magnetic field direction so there is a heat of magnetization. So use your dilution fridge to take away this heat of magnetization. Now you have system at temperature T and a finite same at finite temp, same temperature at some field. Then you do adiabatically reduce the magnetic field, and that again takes away the heat from the surrounding. So you can have what is known as a magnetic refrigeration. So with this you can in principle reach uh, very low temperatures. So what I'm showed here is the entropy as a function of nuclear spin temperature. So you start at 10 millikelvin in a field of 8 Tesla, take away the heat produced by this application of 8 Tesla, then do a adiabatic demagnetization 
you reach 8 milli tesla and then at that 8 milli tesla your temperature goes down to 10 microkelvin so what is the how is it schematically done so this is your dilution fridge you have a co copper foil and then you have a superconducting switch with a magnetic field and this is your nuclear stage your sample is attached to this nuclear stage so what do you do you mag you cool the system to let's say 10 millikelvin you magnetize it with 9 tesla field there will be heat of magnetization keep this switch closed so that the heat which is produced here is taken away to the dilution refrigerator then you close this uh, open this switch so what is this switch this is again an ingenious thing because superconductor though the electrical conductivity is uh, infinite its thermal conductivity will become very very small so you know it will be a good electrical conductor can be a bad thermal conductor at millikelvin temperatures so use that as a thermal switch you know so you when you do demagnetization here you you make this switch uh, superconducting so that there is no heat flow practically no heat flow from here to that place so that is achieved by a just a, you know switching off the field of this superconducting magnet when you want to thermally connect these two you put on a small field so this becomes normal this aluminium becomes normal so it conducts the heat when it becomes superconducting it cuts off the heat leak from here to the mixing chamber so you can do a simple reduce the field slowly and you can do an adiabatic demagnetization reach very low temperature in our case we reach about so this is just to tell you how it is done you know the thermal conductivity of a superconductor you see aluminium it is coming very close to a polymer at low temperatures it is as bad a thermal conductivity as you know this epibond which is the insulating polymer basically because the 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 thermal conduction from the super, uh, normal electrons are reduced because they go into a superconducting state. So we will come to this part a little later. So superconductor can be used as an excellent thermal switch. And that's what we do in the aluminum refrigerator. So this is the one we have in, in my laboratory. This is the dilution refrigerator. So that is commercially available. So what we have done is we have used copper as a nuclear refrigerant. Copper has a nuclear spin three half. So we use about five kg of copper, which is attached to this. So when we cool nuclear demagnetization, we cool this five kilograms copper down to 40 microkelvin. The whole five kilograms is at 40 microkelvin. Why we need such a large weight? Basically, because we need to retain that heat. Remember, room temperature is more than a sun to this small experimental space, right? Your room temperature is 300 K, whereas we are sitting at 40 microkelvin. Heat leak is inev inevitable. Some heat leak will come to the system. So we need to have large cooling power to that system to withstand small heat leaks, which is coming from there. The heat leak from the top to this stage is estimated to be one picoat in our system. So even that, so that is the reason why we need to cool five kilograms of copper at such low temperatures. So somebody then asked, how do you measure these temperatures? So the, the measurement of temperature depends on the temperature range which we use. So normally at high temperatures like above one Kelvin, we have various sensors, you know, resistance sensors, vapor pressure sensors, gas thermometer, and so on. Then slightly lower temperatures use this superconducting fixed points. There are standard superconductors who have different TCs, which can be used as a calibration point. Then you have a melting curve of helium-3, which can be used. So what we use in our experiment is we use this platinum NMR. That is the only thing which can go down to 10 microkelvin. So you measure the magnetic susceptibility, nuclear magnetic susceptibility of platinum, which is related to inverse of temperature to get the, get the low, lowest temperature, which is possible. And intermediate range, we use the noise thermometer. 
noise thermometry actually we have extended down to 0.6 millikelvin so the two sensors which we use are the noise thermometry and the ptnmr so just briefly tell you what is the noise thermometer is so this is the beautiful illustration of non equilibrium thermodynamics you know is called uh, nyquist noise or johnson johnson's noise depending on whether you are a theorist or an experimentalist so the point is that uh, you know it was discovered uh, earlier by johnson and the theory was provided by nyquist who said that you know at any temperature there is a voltage fluctuation caused by the thermal agitation in this case electrons you know in an unbiased conductor because of the temperature t so the mean square voltage is related to the temperature resistance as well as the frequency range and by measuring this mean square voltage or the later on the power spectrum and knowing the value of r and the delta f you can always determine the temperature so this works beautifully from 4.2 kelvin now we have extended down to about 600 micro kelvin so but how do we measure this you know the resistance noise is pretty small so we use what is known as a superconducting transformer coupled to a superconducting quantum from device okay unfortunately superconducting quantum interference device i cannot explain to you it's a magnetometer it is very very sensitive to the flux changes and uh, so the resistor noise is coupled to this inductor and then that is inductively coupled to this quid which will measure this you know the tiny tiny voltage which is developed here so squid can be thought of as current transformer it just amplifies the signal at low temperature and uh, then it picks up by the room temperature so what we do in this you measure the power spectrum as a at uh, at a reference temperature and then measure it at finite temperature so take the ratio of this and usually the t relative is the fixed point is 4.2k itself so you immerse the system in 4.2k then you know you have calibrated this and that works down to about something like 1 millikelvin so this is how and this is commercially available you can buy this so this is the plot you know the v squared as a function of uh, frequency you can fit it to a nice uh, curve and then you can get the temperature out and this is how the temperature goes down you know when you demagnetize it it goes to about something like say, 70 milli 70 millikelvin and then it slowly comes down it takes about 38 36 to 48 hours to cool down from 30, 70 millikelvin to about 17 millikelvin so if you want to measure below so as i said all of these stops at 5 millikelvin or even 1 millikelvin if you want to measure micro kelvin the only option for you is to use the nuclear susceptibility resonance technique so you know that the susceptibility goes as 1 by t to the point t minus theta n or in practical purpose theta n is very small so it goes as c by n t so by measuring the susceptibility you can measure this temperature by calibrating this with respect to again a noise thermometer so what we do is that we do a standard nmr measurements in nmr we apply a steady field along the z axis then an rf field along the y axis and then stop the field let it process uh, in the xy plane and you measure the voltage induced the coil in the z direction again you take the two voltages u1 by u2 is mt1 it's proportional to the magnetization so that is equal to t2 by t1 so by measuring the voltages at the standard temperature with respect to the noise thermometry you calibrate this then you use the nmr uh, system to measure temperature right from so let's say 5 millikelvin to 50 micro kelvin so that's what we we do to measure the temperature so just to tell you the complexity is involved so what we do here see the thermal switch takes the nu nuclear spin so you put the thermal switch off you cool the nuclear stage so by cooling the nuclear stage you are cooling the nuclear spins adiabatic demagnetization cools only the copper nuclear spins hyperfine interaction cools the electrons 
and the electron phonon interaction cools the lattice. And how do we measure the temperature? The cool lattice via electron phonon interaction cools the electrons. The cooled electrons via hyperphi interaction measures the nuclear spins. So here you're using a platinum NMR thermometer to measure. Here you're using the copper stage to go down to lower temperatures. So this process, as you go down lower and lower temperatures, you, your measurements time takes a long time because the thermal thermometer has to come to equilibrium. So at something like 100 microkelvin, you can only take two readings per day. 24 hours, you can have two data points. So you, when the fridge runs, we run it for three to four weeks. Higher temperatures, of course, then you will have more data points, but at the lowest temperature, because the thermal relaxations, everything has to come to the equilibrium temperature, you need to wait for a long time. So the experiments are not for the faint-hearted ones. So, so what we did was we showed that we can cool the system down to 40 microkelvin. Important thing is that we can keep this temperature more than 48 hours for experiments. So once we develop such a facility, you want to compare with the best in the world. So at present, we are third in the list in terms of the lowest temperature. Not only that, in terms of the uh, in the cooling power. So the, the fridge is, you know, it is uh, available to cool systems down to such a low temperature. So now let's come back to this month. So now we have a fantastic ultra low temperature system. And uh, can we try to see what is the case of Bismarck? One of the major problems with uh, superconducting discovery is that when you have such a low TC superconductor, its critical field is also going to be small. The magnetic field will destroy the superconductor, which is well known. So it turns out that as you go lower and lower in superconducting transition temperature, you need to shield it from the Earth's magnetic field because Earth's magnetic field is, you know, 40 to 45 micro Tesla, and that is good enough to kill the superconductivity. Even if you cool down to one micro Kelvin, if you don't shield the system, you are not going to see it. So the second task for us is to shield the Earth's magnetic field. So luckily, there are systems like, you know, cryoperm. It is, it's a high high new metal shield at lower temperatures. So you make two of them, then use lead, lead, you know, lead is a good superconductor. It expels the magnetic field. So that also will act as a shield. So we made a shield out of this and made sure that the field inside is less than four nano Tesla. So, you know, already we are about uh, thousand times or 10,000 times less than the Earth's magnetic field. Remember that the Earth's magnetic field is 40 micro Tesla. So you need to make a chamber of such a low magnetic field environment to test the superconductivity. So Ohm built that, you know, it's almost a zero gas chamber. Not only that, then we need to measure the magnetization. So we have to again employ a squid, squid magnetometer where we buy the basic magnetometer and assemble all the, 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 the magnetometer part. Only the sensor we buy it from outside. The rest is all built ours. So what we see here is the bismuth with the pickup coil, which goes into a squid. Then you can measure its magnetization. So as I said, one of the fu second fundamental property of a superconductor is that it acts like a diamagnet. So when you have a no normal metal below, above its transition temperature, the field penetrates. When you cool it, it expels the magnetic flux. Inside the field is zero. So when you measure the susceptibility as a function of temperature, what you see is a kick like this. You know, it's, it's the diamagnetic susceptibility is almost very, very small. And then you see a huge diamagnetic susceptibility, almost it is minus one. So this is what the TC is all about. So if you do a magnetization experiment, if it is a superconductor, you will get a signal like this. So how do we test our system, whether it works? So you take the lowest superconducting transition temperature element like this rhodium, which was done, you know, more than 30 years ago. And we took that 
rhodium and showed that it is indeed a superconductor at 325 mil micro kelvin slightly less than what they have reported because there is a much purer sample than compared to ours probably important thing is that you measure its critical field as a function of temperature that matches with this paper which was a landmark paper in this uh, superconductivity of rhodium so which means that you know our macrometer works and so we started working with this math so you know we took two crystals and you see that the magnetization is showing diamagnetism and also this diamagnetism as a function of field gets decreased lower and goes to lower and lower temperatures then you can see that critical field as a function of temperature the extrapolated value of this critical field is about 5.2 micro tesla so you can see that you know this is almost one tenth of the earth's magnetic field so if your earth magnetic field is present you will never see the superconductivity of this month and uh, there are you know the pcs theory tells you that the ratio of the critical field to the temperature should be this and it is you know 10 times lower than what we observe the point is that the pcs theory is not applicable but we just wanted to see whether what happens with the numbers the numbers also clearly don't match so what is the superconductivity here so as i said there are two approaches to the high tc problems one is you try to look for the same mechanism electron phonon interaction apply pressure the way people have achieved 288 kelvin in this in this year at 2.7 million megabar then try to work with this compounds uh, you know do an alchemy and try to see whether you can get the superconductivity at re reduced pressure or you go away from the dcs look for a new mechanism for superconductivity so what happens you have you know the phonons are there the electron phonon interaction is the hallmark of the dcs superconductivity but there are systems where the phonons won't work especially in non adiabatic system i told you that you know if you look at this you know there is the the fermi energy is compared to the lattice energy this is where the bismuth comes in there are systems like strontium titanate where the omega d is even larger than ef you know so there are some theories proposed to that and unfortunately what is developed for the strontium doesn't work for the bismuth so what is the what is the, the what are the theories in the market so uh, <laughs> there is certain low energy acoustic plasmons this is what proposed by uh, late professor gorkov as well as gmrc and so on they suggest that there are very tiny excitations which is there in the system and but the spectroscopy measurements rule out that such a thing doesn't exist in this month whereas patrick lee suggest that uh, sorry patrick lee suggest that there could be you know heavy holes in the system which is responsible for superconductivity and uh, baskaran has this resonating wells bond theory and so on so is uh, a lot from imse of fluctuating exciton so it's not clear which of these will is going to explain because many of them their predictions don't match with some of the recent experimental results except that this one because it shows that the the superconductivity seems to come from the presence of heavy holes in the system that seems to be closer to the truth as of now as i said it is still not uh, confirmed but most possible explanation is the model by patrick lee so to sum us summarize i will say that it it's an unconventional superconductor so it has to go beyond the standard models of superconductivity and uh, as i told you most of the things i told you about is magnetization we didn't do a transport you know typically cameling on us you know did the resistance measurements because that was the easier measurement to do at that time but the transport at 100 micro kelvin requires completely different techniques because you can't put a leads there that will conduct heat to the system you will never get the micro kelvin so what you have to do you measure the noise by inductive technique just like temperature we are measuring a noise thermometry this has never been done before so we are 
trying to see whether we can see the resistance going to zero via transport. So that is a difficult experiment at these temperatures, but we also want to see its normal state properties just about TC. The theorists want it. So we still we still are interested to do this transport. And uh, since uh, I'm nearing my limits of uh, time in, in Tata Institute, my student who did this work is continuing to do these transport measurements elsewhere. So hopefully in, in a year's time, we will see those results as well. Then what about superconductivity in other semi-metals like antimony and arsenic? So that has not been seen before. It is just that we need to have a very pure antimony and arsenic to look for beginning of a new class of superconductors, which whose mechanism of superconductivity is certainly not PCS. So finally, <laughs> the road to ULT is difficult, but there is interesting and enough physics at the bottom. The important question one should ask is what is the fate of metals, at least the non-magnetic metals at ultra low temperature, do they become superconductor or do they become something else? Then there are these granular superconductors. You know, if you take platinum is never a superconductor, even down to about 10 microkelvin. But when you make a powdered particle and then compress it and make a small ingot, and then they, they superconduct below one millikelvin. So it's still not sure what is causing this superconductivity. Nanomaterials, granular materials, superconductivity happens in magnetic system is still not understood. And then, you know, you are really into the realm of unknown temperature range where, as I said, there could be tiny interaction which leads to new phase transition like the superconductive ultra pure bismuth. So there are many things possible, many exciting things possible at such low temperatures. And uh, so far I have told you only, you know, ultra low temperatures can be done in uh, two different ways. One is this brute force cooling, which we, which we do. And the, our laser colleagues are more, you know, smarter. So they use the laser to stop the motion of the atoms and get down to very low temperatures. But if you want nuclear refrigeration, you have no option but to do, you know, brute force cooling. So I stop here and uh, feel free to ask me any questions either now or later as well. I left my email ID. So I will have some free time during weekend. So I will certainly answer your questions. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Amgarshan. Uh, <clears throat> it's a very nice talk. Uh, there are uh, some questions already, and uh, which I will ask. And in the meantime, okay. students can uh, write your questions, uh, more questions in the chat. So, and you should muted. Sorry, uh, ah, sorry. Yeah, uh, some some questions are of a basic nature of right. uh, about the theory. So maybe uh, those things I will ask first. So uh, somebody has asked that what is the origin of the forces between electrons to form bound states, uh, Cooper pair? Is it uh, some other kind of fundamental force or part of any fundamental force? Yeah, so there is no new force here. It is, it is just that in, in the case of BCS superconductor, I explained to you, it is the lattice vibration, which is called the phonons are responsible for the, the, bound, the binding of two electrons in the system. In bismuth, it is uh, not very clear. You know, the the one of the theories which says that this holes, you know, changes the dielectric nature of the bism bismuth. This has a very light, a large dielectric constant. It's of the order of hundred. So there, there is there there is a electrostatic uh, disturbance because of these holes and. Uh, there is there is a mechanism which seems to bind these holes, which is not simply phonons, but uh, it is coming because of its uh, self energy correction. So this the the glue for this uh, holes binding is still have to be found out because all this had to come through the experiments. You know, 
this pairing in the case of normal dcs superconductor the pairing came because people found that it is you know oppositely power paired and the charge of the cooper pair is 2e and so on and so forth these came from experiments unfortunately it is easy to do experiments at 1 1 kelvin or above but it is very very difficult to do those kinds of experiments at micro kelvin so we need to do more to understand what the glue is but this is the thing that because of its high dielectric constant the holes can bind together overcome the coulomb repulsion okay thank you uh, there is another question uh, is that is it possible to achieve absolute zero temperature in lab ah, and what would happen if, if see the third third law of thermodynamics tells you that you can never get absolute zero so the the point here is that even in a, in a practical sense you will you know you the best engine we can get is the carnot engine so i will leave this as an exercise to you if you can't then i will provide the answer so you allow a carnot engines to work between two temperatures you know and then try to ask t1 and t2 keep reducing the t1 and t2 and you will see that you know you need as much energy as when you go from 10 kelvin to 1 kelvin 1 kelvin to 0.1 kelvin and 0.1 kelvin to 0.01 kelvin you will see that same amount of energy you have to spend and when you go t tends to infinity you can see that you know the amount of energy you have to spend is almost infinite you cannot get down to this so so this is a small exercise you do otherwise i will give you the answers later so you will see that practically you can never reach absolute zero you can very come close but never go to zero yeah so there is a related question which has immediately popped up uh, is yeah. it possible to achieve arbitrary low temperatures or, or is there some practical limit yeah so typically the problem is the heat leak see it's the practical limit which tells you we can go down to very low temperatures so what is happening is that below let's say 100 micro kelvin you have to be careful because you are using the nuclear spins to cool the electrons and lattice if the spin lattice relaxation times are large the nuclear spin will cool to very low temperatures whereas the electrons and lattice will be at much higher temperatures so nuclear spins can be cool to even pico kelvin you know but that is no relevance to the electrons and lattice you know it's not the equilibrium temperature it is a nuclear spin temperature in fact you can achieve negative temperatures also in nuclear spins because you can populate the levels you know the higher energy levels you can populate more the lower energy populate you can less using 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 magnetic field and so on so that is possible negative temperature is possible with nuclear spins but in real life you want to see nuclear refrigeration you want to cool other materials so you use the nuclear spins to cool the electrons and lattice there the practical limit is about 5 micro kelvin that is the people have gone up to but that is on a smaller system you know it's about something like 150 grams of platinum wire is cooled down to 5 micro kelvin the basic problem is the heat leak the heat leak from the from the room temperature to this crest at you know there is vibration there is electromagnetic radiation then there is all these wires which is coming from the top so the practical limit people have achieved for platinum i think 150 grams of platinum cool down to 5 micro kelvin the large systems where the experiments are done like the one which is at tfr and so on so people have reached up to about 20 micro kelvin and we reached about 40 so that is the uh, that is the limit okay uh, somebody asked that uh, does the zero point energy play any role in the minimum temperature no unfortunately we are not getting into that region right so zero point energy is there even at absolute zero so that comes from the uncertainty principle so we can never reach to that such a low temperatures to do that so okay. we'll never go to that place yeah right what other phenomena are known uh, which occur at ultra low temperatures apart from superconductivity and do they have any future application ah so the question is that whatever happens in ultra low temperature have no future application that much i can tell you that straight away 
So what is, because you can't go to, it's like this high pressure, you know, 2.7 megabar, okay, superconductivity, but it has, right now there is no application. But that doesn't stop people because they are tinkering with the parent material to see whether they can see the same phenomena at, you know, lower pressure and ultimately ambient pressure. Same thing for the ultra low temperature. You find some phenomena and see that, then use a clever uh, metallurgy to push this temperature to a reasonably manageable one so that it can find some application. Superconductivity bond that way. The other interesting thing which happens in such a low temperature is the magnetism of nuclear spins. See, the, the magnetism of electronic spin is well known. It is thousand years known. Then there are, when you, when you try to analyze with theory, there are complications. There is disorder, there is phonons, thermal vibrations and so on and so forth. So the theorists can, it's difficult problem for the theorists to solve, you know, magnetism of uh, compounds or elements and so on, electronic magnetism, because the other effects come in. Whereas if you look at the nuclear spins, you know, the, the present example is producing nickel 5 PR and FI, where the PR nuclear spins order at lower temperatures. At such low temperatures, the lattice vibrations are ruled out because it is so small. So you are talking about ideal nuclear spins. So if you want to test your theory to understand how the nuclear spins get down, now the, how the spins get down to magnetic ordering, the best place is to look for nuclear ordering, nuclear ordering of spins at such ultra low temperatures because you are dealing with pure system. Most of the theories can be, if it doesn't work out, you throw away the theory. If it doesn't ex explain the experiment, then you can throw away theory. So most of the models can be tested there to see their validity at such low temperatures. That is another useful thing which will come. The second thing is that I told you about granular superconductivity. So it happens right now at millikelvin temperatures. We don't know how the superconductivity comes in. What if you can cook up such granular materials at higher temperatures? I know the once you find the reason for it, then it's possible to cook up materials which will occur the same phenomena at higher temperatures. So that is the whole motivation. Apart from, you know, curiosity of studying unusual phase transition at low temperatures, you find out that and then find the real reason for it, then cook up materials which will show the same phenomena at higher temperatures. So that is the case. But there are systems right now uh, operating not at micro Kelvin, but at milli Kelvin temperatures, like uh, superconductivity used in quantum computing. You know, if you look at the, the one, one, one uh, plausible quantum computers is this uh, based on Josephson effect. I think there's TFR, uh, I don't know whether he's going to talk to, on this at, uh, in this uh, meeting, but uh, so this is something which is uh, you need at least 10 millikelvin temperature to work with this system. You know, both of the system like IBM and all those people have this, but this is at much higher temperatures. So, but the basic understanding is that you find a phenomena, then try to find the theoretical reasons for it, correct explanation for it, then cook up materials to push this temperature, transition temperature at higher temperature, then possibly you will see. See, it's like, uh, as I said, when Camerling owners discovered mercury, then people said, why do you want to do it at such low temperature? It's practically impossible. But you saw that after 50 years, after about, let's say after 70 years, the first magnet came from superconductivity. Then after 20 years, something like 80s, you saw the MRI machines come into the fold. So one doesn't know. So the question is that find a phenomena, then you try and see how we can push the transition temperature up. So that is the motivation. Okay. Uh, there are a bunch of questions regarding uh, Bismuth, but uh, all in the same vein. Uh, so okay. basically they're asking, does Bismuth come under the same class of uh, superconductors that you mentioned towards uh, the end for arsenic? Or is there any other, uh, absolutely no other element which behaves like bismuth? Uh, these kind of uh, things are Yeah, so bismuth is a unique element. So nothing is, uh, you know, come close to bismuth. It has its 
very unusual properties, basically because its thermal energy is comparable to the lattice energy. The other elements like antimony and arsenic has the same structure as bismuth, and also it has it, they are also semi-metals. But then their carrier concentration doesn't change. If you look at this, I showed you that plot right from room to pre to do this. So if one sees superconductivity there, and if that is, uh, first of all, nobody has seen superconductivity in arsenic and antimony down to, let's say, 100 microkelvin. And uh, if one sees superconductivity, then one can see, you know, how to distinguish the superconductivity which we seen in bismuth vis-a-vis -vis the superconductivity there. Because the unusual band structure of bismuth, all this carrier concentration, temperature dependence is not seen in antimony and arsenic. So we can try to distinguish, you know, something which has a similar structure, crystal structure, but it has different properties. So one can try to isolate the reasons for it, whether it's coming from the structure or it's coming from somewhere else. So that is the reason why one would like to see superconductivity in antimony and arsenic. Okay. Um, then uh, somebody has asked that uh, even though silver is a very good conductor uh, at room temperatures, why doesn't it become superconductor? Good question. So the silver, see copper, gold and silver. So the only choice of the material is uh, gold. Because see, if I told you this electron phonon interaction, why is the resistance is slow, uh, why small? because the scattering from the phonons is much less in silver as compared to the rest of the metal. So if the electron phonon scattering is less, which means the lambda electron phonon coupling between the phono, uh, electrons and phonon is very, very small. So that is the reason silver is predicted to be a superconductor at uh, sub nano Kelvin, I think. So it's around 20, 30 pico Kelvin. So that is the reason why silver and copper will never superconduct. Gold, there's a chance because the, the electron phonon coupling constant is a little larger from the theoretical side. And it is predicted to be a superconductor at 50 microkelvin. So we have tried to see that, but uh, it, didn't, it didn't show superconductivity. And we know the reason for it because it has 0.5 ppm of manganese. So these magnetic elements are really bad for such superconductors. So this 0.5 parts per million of manganese in pure, so-called the pure silver, pure gold kills its superconductivity. So, so that is the reason. Why all these noble metals? Because the electron phonon coupling is very weak. That is the reason why they have a very high conductivity. So they will never become a superconductor at low temperatures. Okay. Isn't it possible that while trying to measure the noise, the measuring apparatus itself adds to the noise and gives faulty values? Yeah, so the good question. See, the point, point here is that uh, when we measure the noise, we use the squid to amplify it so that uh, the internal noise of the system which we measure is smaller than. Uh, ultimately, that's what limits it. So why can't we measure the noise below 1 millikelvin? or 0.6 millikelvin is basically because the noise of the thermometer comes into the picture, so it levels off. The trade-off is about 1 millikelvin or 0.6 millikelvin. The important thing is that everything is amplified by the squid sitting at uh, very, very low temperatures. Okay. Uh, then, um, I mean, again, they're wondering that uh, things like about absolute zero, that yeah. theoretically, if we are somehow able to control the vacuum fluctuations and able to aim it in such a way that the negative energy ends up at our apparatus, uh, I don't understand fully. Can we reach absolute zero for some practical time? No, no, never. <laughs> so it, it, it violates all the thermodynamic laws. So, uh, you know, one of these days, maybe I... If, I think I will uh, ask him to send it. I will tell them, you know, how the thermodynamics prevents that you can never go to absolute zero. So even if you go in the non-equilibrium state, you cannot reach absolute zero. You can go to negative temperatures and so on for nuclear spins, which is isolated. You know, it's not something which uh, you can realize in the in the in the equilibrium condition. 
but uh, in a non equilibrium condition you can have a negative temperature as well in nuclear spins because you populate the see the temperature is a measure of how it is populated so if the high energy state is populated more compared to the lower energy state you have a negative temperature so we can define that but you can never reach absolute equilibrium temperature absolute zero right uh, are there any other conditions where we observe superconductivity where i believe is meaning uh, apart from low temperatures i think that's the intent of the question yeah no no yes you have superconductivity in stars you know they are in you know uh very large temperatures 10000 or even million temperature and so on there you are talking about different kind superconductivity of different neutron stars you know you you have a superfluidity there which is close to the superconductivity which you see here so that is something which is uh, totally different and a totally different phenomena occurs there All right uh in the beginning you said that with judicious choices of elements we can uh, make alloys that has higher tc but how right. do we make such choices yeah good question see this is a million dollar question because people have been doing you know when you when two elements are superconducting you try to mix them try to do a band structure calculation and see whether you know ultimately what is the criteria which pushes the tc if you believe bcs then you have to make sure that the theta d which comes in the tc debye temperature has to be large so all these high pressure people that's what they are trying to do they are taking hydrides you know hydrogen metallic hydrogen is supposed to have a debye temperature of the order of 1000 so it all started with that the theory said you make a metallic hydrogen under pressure then it will become a superconductor in room temperature so the whole thing started because of that so initially they tried to squeeze hydrogen gas became a solid but then unfortunately it was meta stable and so on and so forth so it was not possible the whole thing was abandoned in 70s and late 80 uh, this one in the late 80s then people started working on hydrides and in 2000 people really started working on hydrides different hydrides and instead of squeezing hydrogen they squeezed the hydrides and this ermets in in germany he is the first guy who tried this hydrides to get into a you know tra- transition temperature in some of these sulfurous hydrides where he showed around 200 220 kelvin at 2 megabar and not only that he showed that you know it is electron phonon interaction how did he show that he deuterated the hydride and then applied the pressure showed that that has a lower tc and because of that we know that the electron phonons are involved there and uh, the important thing there is that the debye temperatures are large in that case so that is how they achieve this high tc so you know there is no straight hard and fast rule on this so it depends on how ingenious you are and uh, you try to see and uh, that is how it has been happening but uh, the progress in ambient superconductivity is quite uh, low till this high tc oxides came you know that came by accident if you look at this paper in 1986 by zfizik it's you know they talk about some oxide they talk about some resistivity going to very low value and so on it's a badly written paper they got the nobel prize for it because they were on to something which is very very fundamental so you know it changed the landscape people never thought that they are going to have a superconductivity above the liquid nitrogen temperature so they provided the path for it so that was just an accident i would say and they were working on magnetism and then they landed to superconductivity so that is as i said there is no straight rule for this each one has his own idea of how to go about this the high pressure guys are ruling the last 5 6 years because every day there is a note that tc has gone from 200 to 220 220 to 240 now it's at 288 they <laughs> certainly cross 300 by the end of next year the way it is going but the important thing is that that is an important piece of research but the important thing there is that they need to find materials again 
which will show the same phenomena at lower pressure that ambient pressure just like you know our case we find something at ultra low temperature ultimately if you want to be a practical significance it has to work at room temperature so that is the goal so they are trying to reduce the pressure to go down to the uh, to a workable practically applicable superconductor so we are trying to raise this temperature by finding something interesting so th there are two different approach to the superconductivity one is this way other one is looking for exotic mechanism other than phonon interaction to see whether we can reach high te high temperature superconductor so as cambling on his famously put it the time only can tell <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I think uh, last two questions. I'll just uh, yeah sure. You. So one is that uh, is there a, a correlation between uh, ambient pressure and high pressure, and can one make predictions by uh, extrapolation? No, not in this case uh, of uh, this uh, high pressure superconductors, because uh, for them, you know, when we reduce the pressure. at uh, at uh, the ones which are superconducting let's say at uh, 250 kelvin or so when they reduce the pressure down to zero the the they are unable to keep the stability of that system it goes to zero i mean the tc goes to zero so if you extrapolate it you always land up with the zero temperature see the only thing which they can try to do is try to find metastable structures so you squeeze this thing top to largest temp largest pressure keep it superconducting release the pressure so that slowly that it is in a metastable state for a longer time period of time where application can be thought of so that the whole game is now towards that you know they have raised the tc now they have to find out metastable states by introducing possibly another chemical element onto this parent compound try to see whether you can achieve a long term metastability of this structure so that when the pressure is removed it still the structure still survives so that is the game there right okay uh, someone just asked that uh, why do we consider a uh, whole current why do uh, why do we have whole current she says she has never understood it properly so if you can yeah. say if you want yeah so see the the as you go down to see the, in the in the metals the there are no excitations across the across the any energy gaps so for semiconductors you know you have a small band gap so when the electrons get excited across the gap it leaves this pos positive charge at the at the valence band so they are what is known as the holes if you if you do go to let's say charles kittel or some solid state physics book it tells you why the holes are created because it has to be a, you know the system has to be neutral so when the electrons get excited you have positive negative charge and then it has to be compensated by a positive charge which is the hole so that is what is happening in bismuth you have a direct energy gap although in some bands are overlapping but you have this so you have both holes as well as electrons so it's called a compensated metal you know they are both are there at the equal concentration so my advice to you just take up kittel and see how how the holes are coming into the picture in semiconductors and so on it will you will get clear okay finally uh, somebody has asked just out of curiosity do any species like super insulators exist and if so they can uh, can we couple them with superconductors yeah see super insulators exist but they you know you don't have to cool them to get it they are exist in uh, many form i mean the best uh, uh, there are two kinds of super insulators one is electrically super insulating diamond is the best example for that and uh, if you want a super thermal insulator then there are polymers which are uh, really thermally insulating and so on but you cannot couple a insulator to the superconductor because how the charge carriers will come across so the only way one can do but people have done that in a way that you take a sandwich you take two you know oxides which are you know insulating 
the interface for some reason becomes a superconductor because uh, you know this is something which has happened 10 years ago it became a very unusual thing because you can have a 2d electrons which is combined between these two insulators and though th those undergo superconductivity so this is called the interface superconductivity whereas the the in between the two insulators so there i think you can study and people have made devices and so on and so forth but that is in the thin film region not you know bulk okay thank you uh, thank you professor ramakrishnan i think uh, um, i will send you the uh, chat yeah, right. script and you can uh, look at uh, sure, the questions sure. and if you feel like you can answer on the moodle or by email Okay. And uh, I would request everybody to unmute and uh, please applaud. A round of applause for Professor Ramakrishnan. Thank you so much for Thank you. taking out uh, time to do this. Uh, and that, that's okay. Yeah. So I think uh, once this COVID situation hopefully it comes all right, you, I would like you to visit the labs and see when how things are being done there. So that is the that is that would be more interesting also for you, some of you at least. Thank you. Thank you for your. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just remind the students that uh, the uh, open room will be uh, on from uh, eight or eight o'clock, eight p.m. Okay, Anvish. Thank you. I'm leaving now. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.